How safe do you feel on an airplane these days? How secure do you think the cockpit is? Are flight crews as protected as they could be, or is there still some chance that someone could breach the cockpit of a commercial airliner? Well, Ellen Saracini, whose husband Victor was one of the pilots murdered on September 11th, says flight crews could be vulnerable if airlines make some proposed changes, and she's here to tell us this hour why. But aviation expert John Gagliano disagrees, arguing safety measures have been in effect since September 11th. Their debate starts right now, here on It's Your Call. Hello everyone, it's good to have you with us. I'm Lynn Doyle. As anyone who travels knows, extreme security measures have been in place since September 2001. In the aftermath of those horrific attacks on September 11th, the government and the airline industry put into place procedures designed to keep terrorists off planes, to limit access to anything that could be used as a weapon on a plane, and to make sure the cockpits could not be breached. And yet, there have been many serious attempts to take down airliners in the last 12 years. This is of concern, of course, to all of us, but especially to Ellen Saracini, whose husband, Victor, was the captain of United Flight 175, which was the second plane to hit the World Trade Centers. She believes strongly that to prevent such a tragedy from reoccurring, there needs to be secondary barriers between passengers and the cockpit. That's why she's garnering support for the Saracini Aviation Act, which would require airlines to have two barriers to the cockpit. She joins us first this hour. It's good to have you back with us, Ellen. It's so nice to be back, Lynn. You know, I'm looking at those pictures of Victor, and I feel like I know him because we've talked about him so often in the last 12 years. In that time frame, have you speculated or theorized what happened on his plane and in the cockpit that day? I think uh, it's pretty clear to all of us. It's, it's as simple as there was a breach of the cockpit. And with that, uh, we are now are missing 2,973 people. So I've been trying to be very active, making sure that a breach of the cockpit doesn't happen again. Has anyone from the government or the airline industry ever discussed with you how that breach of the cockpit may have occurred? Have they put any kind of speculation or ideas out for you to consider? Well, uh, pre-September 11th, the um, procedures on an aircraft were much different than they are today. Uh, typically, an airplane would be hijacked. It would go to a destination. Somebody would be released. Uh, you you um, aided the requests of the hijacker. Now, we don't do that anymore. We realize that there are terrorists and, and hijackers there that are not looking to have it where they end in a destination. They're wanting to use the aircraft as a weapon of mass destruction. So the procedures now are very different than they were back then. And of course, Victor and all the pilots of that era had been trained to deal with a potential hijacking. So he was probably aware of what was going on at the time. But if the hijackers had not been able to breach the cockpit, perhaps he may have been able to, it might have been a different ending to that day. Victor, his voice can be heard on a voice recorder talking to um, the, the uh, control tower saying that he had identified uh, the aircraft that was uh, off course, um, not realizing, I'm sure, that right after that his door was going to be breached. And uh, yes, things are a lot, would be a lot different today had they had knowledge that this was going to be uh, a wave of the future that we have to worry about, um, not only terrorists but also unstable individuals individuals trying to get into the cockpit. Now immediately following September 11th, new procedures were put into place to further protect pilots and the flight crew. At the time it was called secondary barriers. Can you just give our viewers a, an overview of, of essentially what it is? Sure. Um, what happened right after September 11th is the um, realizing that a breach was an issue. Uh, fortified cockpit doors were mandated to be put on every aircraft, and they were. But soon afterwards, because of operational use. Congress and the airline companies and the pilots realized that during flight the doors would have to be open for crew rest breaks, for meals, and for restroom facilities. And during that time the cockpit door is not fortified. So United in response to that um, and Northwest installed something called a secondary barrier. What it is is a, it's a lightweight gate that gets locked into place and then the cockpit door can be opened up. Then once the cockpit door is closed, 
the, the secondary barrier would be folded back. And what it does is just create a sterile environment right outside of the cockpit during those times in flight when the door is open. Now sometimes I've been on a flight where the flight attendant would actually move the serving cart in front of that and I often thought to myself, boy, <laughs> I could even hurdle that if I had to. It probably isn't as effective. Is this so-called secondary barrier has been deemed effective? There were, um, the FAA called for a study. It involved all the shareholders. So the FAA, the TSA, the airline companies, Boeing, and security experts were involved in the RTCA study. There was another study from the Cato Institute. Uh, both of them, independent studies, came to the same conclusion that secondary barriers were the most cost effective and the best method in order to protect the cockpit of a breach. And that's essentially what the Saraceni Aviation Act would require. Mm -hmm. So why now are you prompted to actually encourage Congress to pack, pass such an act if that was already in place? Yes, a good question. Um, United Airlines ordered the new aircraft, the Dreamliner 787, and Boeing, and kudos to Boeing and Airbus, in all their new designs of their aircraft, they have installed an option for a secondary barrier gate. And the um, infrastructure is there integral with the airplane okay. for to hold the, the secondary barrier gate. All you have to do is order the gate. So United Airlines paid for them to be installed on their airplanes. Before the airplanes were delivered, Continental and United merged. And now it's a new Continental management. So the CEO, Jeffrey Smizek, decided to pay Boeing extra to remove the secondary barriers. And it was at that point that I became aware of it and, and I'm here today because of it. All right, so to the average outsider, it sounds like perhaps this is a financial decision. This is why they've made the call, but we're not quite sure. So we invite it, Unite It, to be represented here on the show and explain uh, their position. While they declined to appear, they did send us this response. Quote, at United, the safety and security of our customers and coworkers is paramount. We continue to work with industry and government leaders to enhance the safety and security of the cockpit security measures. They have evolved in the years since the secondary barriers were ordered and many more layers of security now exist. While we don't discuss the details of the security measures that are used for a particular aircraft or a particular flight, we thoroughly carry out our security responsibility for every flight. And that comes from Kristen David, who is the spokeswoman and director of corporate communications for United Airlines. We're going to give you an opportunity to weigh in and tell us what you think about it and how safe you feel uh, without these secondary barriers on a flight that you might be taking in just a moment. But first, I do want to get perspective from the airline industry. John Gagliano is an aviation attorney with the Wolk Law Firm in Philadelphia. He's a former Navy pilot who flew missions in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we welcome him to the program. John, it's nice to have you here. It's great to be here. Thanks. Lynn. I particularly want to hear your perspective because you served two tours in Iraq and Afghanistan. In fact, actually going there almost immediately after September 11th. I would think that you might support as many security measures as possible on commercial airlines. And like you say, it's not necessarily uh, a requirement these days. Well, it's not a requirement yet. Um, Mrs. Saracena is lobbying to make it a requirement, and I don't oppose it. Uh, necessarily. My point though is that once a terrorist is on an airplane, the certainty, it's, it is a certainty that terrorism will occur. If someone is willing to trade their life in an act of terror, then there's nothing, a secondary barrier or a cockpit door, or anything else is going to prevent that from happening. Now, they may not be able to reach the cockpit, but they certainly have the opportunity and will carry it out. Uh, to commit terrorism. You know, it's interesting that you say that because we've seen in the past 12 years someone try to put a bomb in his shoe, someone who was willing to put a bomb in his shorts. So essentially what you're saying, if I'm hearing you correctly, is that if someone is willing to do whatever it takes to take down a plane, a secondary barrier or even a third barrier is not going to stop that person. That's absolutely right. I think that efforts need to be put in place, and obviously they are, uh, to prevent that terrorist from getting to the airport in the first place and once they're in the airport if they get there to prevent them from getting on the plane that's where the focus needs to be placed and I'm not necessarily opposed to the secondary barrier but I just think that once the terrorist is on the plane the secondary barrier is going to be ineffectual. Well I have to ask what I think probably viewers at home are asking what's the difference 
what harm would it do to have a secondary barrier unless, of course, it comes down to dollars and cents and airlines just don't want to pay the extra money? I mean, what it's not going to do any harm to have it there, right? Well, it, it certainly is a weight. Um, there's a weight penalty. Anytime you add equipment to the plane, there's a weight penalty. It may not be a great one, but it certainly is a factor. There was a white paper uh, that was put out by the Airline Pilots Association in, uh, I believe it was 2003, that discussed that um, there's a potential for uh, insurance premiums to go down with the secondary barrier in place. So I think that perhaps any cost expenditure to put it in place in the first place may be offset by insurance premiums you know, being discounted in the future. So I'm not sure that uh, it's a dollars and cents thing. I just think my point is essentially that we should really make sure that these people are not getting on planes in the first place. Okay, we're going to give our viewers a chance now that they've heard from both sides to tell us what you think. Are the safety measures that are in place enough or do you think there's never enough safety in place to keep our pilots and passengers safe? Do you think it is all about money or do you feel like enough is being done to keep you safe? If you want to join in, if you have questions or comments, you can email me directly at lynn at lindoyle.net. You can also find us as always on Facebook and Twitter. When we come back, we're going to let Ellen and John talk it out and see what they think of each other's perspectives. We'll be right back. seems like almost yesterday and yet it seems like an eternity ago, September 11th, the day our lives as Americans changed forever, when terrorists slammed four U.S. commercial airliners into the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, and into a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It also changed Ellen Saracini's life forever, as well as her husband, the father of her children, and a longtime United Airline pilot Victor Saracini was killed by the terrorist who overtook his cockpit. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking with her about her mission to have secondary barriers to cockpits remain mandatory along the commercial airline industry. We want to know what you think, so you can email me at lynn at lynndoyle.net. So, Ellen, you had a chance to listen to John and John's perspective that if a terrorist wants to get on a plane and is willing to put his life on the line to take that plane down, the passengers and the flight crew, that the secondary barriers wouldn't really deter an individual like that. Your response? I can totally agree that we have to have better security procedures set before anyone gets on the aircraft. Um, but what we have right now is the TSA being in charge of that. Uh, the TSA is really in turmoil. We had um, the, the director almost getting knives being put back on airplanes. My, my thing to that is he said we're looking, um, our new focus is explosives. If it's new, I don't know what they've been doing the last 12 years. But that being said, terrorists will look for weaknesses. And if we allow knives back on airplanes, it is not bombs that brought down four airliners, it is knives that brought down four airliners. They now are being reprimanded for their um, inability to have their employees be doing their job. They are allowing people to go through security without being detected. They are, allow they are not looking at the scanned items as they're going through. They are sleeping on the job. Um, Kip Hawley recently in a political article said that passengers were now a line of defense in order to protect the cockpit and the airplane. John? Well, I certainly am not the hugest fan of the TSA since I travel so much, but um, <laughs> That's not the only line of defense against terrorists, and uh, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes, um, thankfully, and we haven't had a repeat, thankfully, again, of 9-11. Um, the cockpit doors were reinforced after 9-11, and um, in addition to that reinforcement where they added honeycomb and ballistic coating that is supposed to be able to survive now, uh, they say, a 44 Magnum bullet, they also added an increased um, peephole, I guess is the best way to call it, so that the people in the cockpit can see a wider angle of what's going on in the plane. And the estimates are that when that cockpit door is opened several hours into the flight for the air crew to take a coffee break or to use the restroom or whatever right. that is that they have to do, um, that takes five seconds. So the air crew in the cockpit can look through that peephole in the new fortified doors after 9-11 and see if there's anyone waiting in line for the forward lavatory or within five seconds of the door, and they certainly have eyes in the aircraft right. being the flight attendants, uh, where they can kind of make that determination before the cockpit doors open so that everyone 
remain safe. And it's funny because um, the airline industry has also been quoted as saying that the, they have additional security measures in place. Of course, they don't want to share that with the general public because then you inform potential terrorists. But one of the things is that flight um, air marshals are on flights now and they are in position to detect if someone appears suspicious. There's a lot of classified information that I can't tell you right now, but the studies have been done. The studies looked at everything. They looked at having a, a linebacker type intruder with the cart and a linebacker type um, person acting as the flight attendant. Mm -hmm. It is scary to know the short amount of time that they can get into the cockpit knowing that there is a breach going to happen or, or attempt and, and being able to get past the cart and past that flight attendant who is a security expert. This is just in the studies. Um, they looked at federal air marshals and they looked at the FFDO program. Uh, the FFDO program is the pilots who are armed in the cockpit. There are severe limitations to both of those um, in, in that I can't discuss its classified information. They are not, however, on every flight, and they are not on a large majority of the flights. Um, then they looked at secondary barriers. Secondary barriers are the most cost-effective um, and the best method. They are on 100% of the flights and work 100% of the times. When they trained in the study someone to be able to open the door, it was enough time to allow the cockpit to become alerted of an issue and simply to be able to close the cockpit door before there, there was an intrusion. So that was the only method that 100% of the time you could be protecting the cockpit. And if we're talking about weight, these barriers that were already on United Airlines weigh 40 pounds. We cannot determine that 40 pounds is too much to protect it. Um, there is a severe risk of a, of a breach. Um, and when we're talking about these doors, these doors were five to $6,000 installed. Um, the airlines pay a million dollars for their in-flight entertainment system on each flight. So we can't be thinking that the cost is too much. And when you look at the ramifications of what the cost was to our, um, our psyche, our, our economy, um, after September 11th, the government even came out with a victim's compensation fund because they said they had to protect its citizens. The amount that was left to our government to, to pick up and, and cover was, was ridiculous when we're talking about a fix that two studies have looked at and both studies say that we need the secondary barriers. The interesting point that Ellen just made is that millions of dollars are being spent on in-flight entertainment. So I guess you could really take the argument if it's dollars and cents that they're weighing that, that I would prefer to have more security on board than my on-flight entertainment. But as you pointed out, it's not necessarily a dollar and cents issue, but it's just that there are already security measures in place and the government is already regulating it as much as possible. Do we really need any more? Sure, I would say that we don't need any more regulations. Um, and I think that the cockpit secondary barrier, if you've looked at it, is really just a series of steel cables uh, that are really you know, thinner than your pinky that uh, a bolt cutter could get through very easily, um, if that's the concern. I know that in Israel, uh, uh, the airlines have two sets of fortified doors with a hallway in between them, and that uh, is actually something that may be considered, but the secondary barrier as it stands, I don't think is as effectual um, as it other. would be to, as other methods out there that are being used in Israel, and certainly not uh, keeping in terrorist off the plane has got to be the first priority. Well, I think I have to agree with you that uh, we need to look at the, the people who are letting people on the planes because I travel quite a bit and it's a little freaky. But I do want to thank you so much for being with us to share your perspective and the perspective of some of the airline industry. We also do want to say a thank you to you for the service that you provided the United States when you were in Iraq and Afghanistan as a, a, a pilot. We appreciate it. Thanks. I have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're going to talk more with Ellen Saracini about her role with uh, various things going on after September 11th, including the Garden of Reflection. So please stay with us for that. We are looking at the Garden of Reflection in Yardley, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, which is the official remembrance site for the state. Ellen Saracini and a group of other men and women who lost loved ones on September 11th worked tirelessly to have it established, and it was her first post-9-11 mission. 
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Lynn Doyle. This is It's Your Call. And if you can believe it, it's nearly 12 years since September 11th changed all of our lives. It was uh, perhaps most, most life-changing for Ellen. And since that time, you have embraced a number of causes that relate to the security of the United States and to the protection of its citizens. This idea of secondary barriers in airlines is really the latest in a long line of issues that you've been involved with. Absolutely, because there is still a risk of a breach of the cockpit. Um, you know, as we were just talking and, and debating whether it was should be on or not, all of our experts say that it should be on. And while I appreciate the um, aviator, uh, the naval aviator that was just here, we also he also is not um, on a commercial aircraft and doesn't really understand the complexities with the airlines and, and security. Um, when we're having Congress say, uh, the FAA say, we need to look into this because now we have a fortified cockpit door. The problem is, once someone gets behind that door, it's a fortified cockpit door. No one can retake the aircraft. And as I said, this is just one of the many issues that you found yourself involved in in the past 12 years. Why do you feel compelled to stay at the forefront and to, to have your voice heard, particularly in Washington, D.C.? Because Victor doesn't have a voice anymore, and because 2,972 other people don't have a voice anymore. You know, Lynn, I've been asked by some congressmen um, why I'm doing this, and I said to them, I cannot look another family member in the eye if another tragedy happens and say, I'm sorry, I knew that there was a risk of a breach of the cockpit and I didn't do anything about it. So I, I have a lot of brothers and sisters with the airlines and I'm, I'm there for them and I'm there for, for you and for everyone who travels and for any potential target. Well, we certainly appreciate it. Another thing that uh, you were very uh, forceful in getting enacted was this uh, Garden of Reflection, which is one of the most beautiful places in the state of Pennsylvania. It continues to be a source of pride for you and the others, uh, particularly from Bucks County, who lost loved ones. Yes, uh, you know, it, it, it's mission accomplished when I think of um, all that, that the families wanted and the architect, Luba Lashik. Um, we wanted a place where everyone could go, and if it was your worst day, uh, we didn't want anyone to say, we can't go to the Garden of Reflection, it's too, too hard. What people are saying is, I'm really having a hard day, I need to go to the Garden, I need to have that um, complacency and that, that just feeling of peace, and when you can walk around, you really get a perspective on how precious life is. And even though, as you said, mission is accomplished, there's still a need for people to support the garden because now that it's a beautiful place to go and remember and reflect, uh, it still needs to be maintained. So is it an ongoing mission for you to keep it up? Yes, we've established a Remembrance Fund endowment. Um, we're now fundraising, um, again, because we have to preserve the integrity of the garden. And so we are um, always fundraising, and we're going to raise about $2 million, and that in perpetuity will be able to uh, make sure that the garden is, stays there so that future generations can remember and reflect on the events. Well, as we've done for the past 12 years and have been proud to do. We're going to put up some information here so that if people do want to support, and I encourage you to do that, you can do it either by visiting the website or by check there. And I, I love those pictures. I, I can't look at them enough. They're just absolutely beautiful. So we want to thank you for all the work that you've done on behalf of the citizens of Pennsylvania and, in fact, for all Americans in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And if you would like to comment or um, support the Garden of Reflection, you can always email me at lynn at lynndoyle.net. Until then, my thanks to my crew and to you for watching. Please always remember September 11th.